Hello, kidney warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is another episode of Dadvice TV Live. And I'd like to take a moment and welcome everyone that's new, that's out here watching us for the first time. Great to have you here. Hop on over to YouTube and subscribe to the Dadvice TV channel and get lots more content like what you're going to see tonight. Now, for those of you that are new, go ahead, introduce yourself, say hello in the comments. We got a great community here. It's very simple. I said actually talking about kidney disease in a way where we don't have all that fear. We start understanding, hey, here's what matters. Things aren't as bad as they may sound. It really, really is helpful. So tonight I'm going to start from stage five and work backwards. So a lot of you have heard of the stages one th through five. And stage five is one of the worst named uh, stages. It's called end stage kidney disease. And... Um, because it's had so much confusion about, oh, that's the end stage and that means I should be on dialysis. No, that's not the case. <clears throat> so the latest classification calls uh, stage 5D, which is people that are on dialysis with an EGFR of less than 15. So if you've got stage 5, is it a time to panic? And the answer is no. And let me tell you why. First of all, um, people do not need to go on dialysis just because they got a kidney number below 15. All of the international kidney organizations have agreed that the reason for anyone to start dialysis is not just your number, although the number has something to do with it, but it's mostly your symptoms. And... A lot of the symptoms that people have, uh, and they don't usually start, by the way, until your EGFR is less than 30, CKD4, uh, or 5, less than 15. And there's a lot of misinformation about, well, my EGFR is 40, 50, 60. I'm, am I going to have symptoms? Highly unlikely. So if you are a CKD5, what are the symptoms that you may have that may justify at least considering dialysis. The most common ones are nausea and vomiting, shortness of breath, and swelling. Now, nausea and vomiting can be due to a lot of things. It could be due to what we call comorbidity. You may have some other GI problem unrelated to your kidney function level. And it could be due to your kidneys but the recommendation is when you're in stage five, before you get put on dialysis, try to treat any of the symptoms, whether it's shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, or swelling, treat them medically before you agree to go on dialysis. Now, people could be short of breath because of lung disease. And I had one of my patients who, a uh, funny story, who... Um, Nice old fellow, end-stage lung disease with CKD4. And I told the family, very straightforward, that he does not need to worry about his kidneys. His lung problem is a much more serious problem, and that's the likely way that he's going to die, not from kidney problems. And some people may have swelling or edema with stage 5, and that could be due to heart failure. And lots of folks with heart failure go on dialysis. But again, it's worthwhile to ask your doctor when you're at stage five and if you have heart failure, if you could be treated medically with diuretics and other treatments for your heart. So what about people that have to worry about their kidney number? When do you need to worry and go on dialysis? Very, very rare. There's something called pericarditis, which we hardly see anymore, or seizures. People with CKD5 who have that, those problems or intractably high potassium or intractable nausea and vomiting, no other cause, I'm fine with 
you're agreeing to go on dialysis. But that's not going to be the majority. The majority of people are going to uh, be asymptomatic or have mild symptoms. Now, the other thing to realize is that that number, let's say it's 15 or 10 to 15, it's not an accurate number. There's a lot of confusion about the reliability of this number. The number could be plus or minus 10 or 20 percent. So if you're 15, you could be plus 2 or 3 uh, either way. You could be 12, you could be 18. Uh, and that goes for uh, any level of VGFR. It could be plus or minus at least 10 percent. Now, as we've talked about, the number you get on your labs is called EGFR. It's your estimated kidney function or estimated glomerular filtration rate. And as we've discussed many times, the estimate is, is comes from an equation and they plug in factors depending upon whether you're a male or female, you're African American, and what your age is. And if you're a person that's either a very low in muscle, a very high in muscle, you've had a lot of wasting of muscle tissue, the kidney number is not reliable at all. You need to do measure your kidney function or 24-hour urine for creatinine clearance if there's doubt about what your kidney number is because you lots of muscle, very little muscle, and so forth. Um, the other way that you can be in stage 5 could be AKI. And often it's from low blood pressure, severe dehydration, being on different severe uh, acute renal failure and and your urine output falls a good bit that's a time when you may need to go on dialysis the problem with getting an accurate kidney number is it's only good to be measuring it when your blood creatinine to be stable so when kidney functions changing that number is not of kidney disease you need to have repeated values at least over three months that are compatible with whatever stage you think you have. Questions of diuretics. You may have potassium problems that can happen certainly with stage five. And they may be due, we talked about this last time, it could be due to your medicines very commonly. Lots of medicines cause high potassium. Uh, and there are treatments for that high potassium. Once we've ruled out the reversible causes, we could put you on a potassium binder. And I've had lots of folks on potassium binders with stage five who did fine for a good while. So there are ways to treat things medically without rushing on to dialysis. And the main message, which I discuss at length in my book, is if you're over 10, okay, repeated values of your kidney number, you're in stage five, but your kidney number is over 10. The research in over 1 million patients, and my research is very prominent in this area about level of kidney function and how people do when they go on dialysis. Studies across the world have shown starting early, which is over 10, may give you a shorter survival. So over 10, you got to get your doctor to convince you as to why he or she is saying it's time to go on the machine. That is, I mean, that's actually really, really good news because when I was diagnosed, there were a lot of people that I ran into that were, you know, 15 on dialysis as soon as they hit stage five and being given this opportunity to try medication and other things to manage your symptoms could be a huge improvement to their quality of life and what you just mentioned, a longer life if you start dialysis later. Yeah, all the reasons and people wonder why could that be, Is I'm, aren't I better off if I got a kidney problem going on the machine? No, you're not better off because the machine has a lot of downsides. Lot, and, and I'm not going to go into them tonight, but look at my book. There's lots of reasons why people who start dialysis too early don't do as well as if their dialysis were at a lower level of kidney function. Now, the one stage, which is the stage for, 
for uh, Dad uh, James Fabian is stage four. Now, stage five, there's lots of controversy. Should we start dialysis? At what level should we start dialysis? And so forth and so on. Should it be called end stage? Lots of controversy. Guess what? Stage four is probably the least controversial stage. So, James, you're in the least controversial stage of CKD, in my opinion. <laughs> No. <laughs> now, now, did that make you feel better? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I completely understand it. Stage five, you know, the name, end stage renal failure, but you still <coughs> could go so long within that stage, you know, without any really serious problems. Stage three is very confusing because of 3A, 3B, it, it, it spans such a large gap. And a lot of times we're not taking age into account. And a lot of people are more experienced. You know, I like that word instead of older. <laughs> are more experienced. They may be in their upper 70s and they fall in that higher end of stage three. And it almost sounds bad when they go on the internet. It does sound bad when they go on the internet, but it may not be something they really need to worry about. They have other things that are more critical for them to worry about. Yeah, we're going to get to that in just a minute, James. But let's go stay with stage four. Mm -hmm. So stage four, 15 to 30. And I'm assuming, again, that you've got a stage four with a repeat value three months apart that shows that it's in that range. And again, these ranges are arbitrary. It could have been, you know, 17 to 35. I mean, they're just round numbers and they used for kidney researchers to classify patients to figure out, you know, what, what makes sense. So when is it more concerning and when is it less concerning to have stage four? Not everybody with stage four is in trouble. Uh, less concerning if you do not have protein in the urine. And we'll discuss that at length in a minute. Less concerning if, let's say, you're over 75 or so. Uh, less, con less concerning uh, if you um, are uh, not having any other cardiovascular risk factors. Now, in general, if you are having significant protein, the approach to your CKD3, uh, 4 rather, should be somewhat aggressive. And again, I'm not talking about stage three. I'm talking about stage four. So in stage four, if you have significant protein in the urine, this is when low protein diets may have a role and even very low protein diets. If you are not diabetic, low protein diets are not recommended for diabetics because of the potential that you're going to get malnutrition, and hypoglycemia, dangerously low blood sugars. But if you are relatively young, if you have protein in the urine, if you are stage four, in my mind, you're a candidate for aggressive treatment, which means trying to get your blood pressure to a goal of 110 to 120 and considering low protein or very low protein diets. That's the situation that I would uh, consider those things. Not for people with stage three, not for, and, and stage five, the low protein diet is probably not as useful. Uh, by stage five, it may not be that useful. Certainly, the sweet spot is CKD4, stage four. That's where I would say the low protein diet, aggressive blood pressure control makes sense. And when you get to stage four is the time that you're going to start having the other issues that come along with a kidney problem. You may well have anemia, which we're going to talk about in another session, which is, which is easily treatable with a drug called EPO. You may have buildup of acids in your blood. Mm -hmm. Again, easily treatable with sodium bicarbonate. And that may have a benefit for not only your health in general, but it may slow your kidney decline. And then there's also bone disease that comes along with CKD. 
which is another conversation not for tonight. But all of every single stage of kidney disease, even stage five, all of the things that we talked about many times to lower your risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, hardening of the arteries, is very important because you become at increased risk of dying from heart attack, strokes, heart failure, uh, decreased blood flow to your extremities. You become a higher risk of having those atherosclerotic problems with lower levels of kidney function. So you need to do the exercise. You need to keep your blood pressure controlled. You need to stop smoking, the biggest risk factor that can kill you. You need to get your lipids under control with an LDL below 100. And I try to even go, if I'm aggressive, less than 70 for your LDL. <laughs> this goes for all of you, but especially for stage 4, because you are at a higher risk. And stage 4 with protein, especially. And if you're a diabetic with stage 4 and significant protein, take these risk factors seriously. Get your exercise, get your blood pressure under control, and get your weight under control. Get your LDL under control. That can save your life and add years to your, le to your life and quit smoking. Let's get into protein, and we'll get into protein now with stage 1 and 2. Stage 1 and 2 is really not kidney disease in my mind unless you have significant protein in the urine. Stage 1 and 2 is over 60 EGFR. Now, what is significant protein in the urine? Now, we used to just, and we talked about this quite a bit, James knows about having jugs with liters of urine in your fridge. We used to do 24-hour collections. I had all my patients bring in these 24-hour collections. They never did them right. They varied from one collection to another because they just didn't know how to time them. Well, it's so, hard when you get up in the morning. There's a whole process there. The first day, you don't collect it you pee in the toilet then you collect all of them plus the first the next day it's it really does get complicated and if you're working it's really um interesting to collect uh, oh is 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 that our is that our orange juice in the fridge oh no no that's my urine <laughs> yeah you don't want to label it james's urine put it in the company fridge <laughs> So I, I will just explain, for those of you who do a 24-hour urine, it's a simple process. Let's just get it out there. What you do is when you wake up in the morning, dump it in the toilet. First urine, dump it in the toilet. The rest of your urine until the next morning all goes in the jug. When you get up the next morning and you pee in the jug, you're done. That's how you collect the 24-hour urine, whether it's for protein or for creatinine clearance. So there's so much confusion in the literature as to what should be called normal protein in the urine. And there's a lot of debate about which method should be used, just like G GFR. All kinds of debate and controversy as to what's the best way to measure GFR or kidney function. Now, as far as protein... Normal urine has protein in it. It's got these proteins that come from the tubules, a part of your kidney. And you don't have to know this word, but it's called Tam Horsefall. It's somebody's name. Normally, you got some of that protein in the urine. And you have very little albumin in the urine. That's the business end of urine protein. Now, for those of you who are not in the United States or Canada, you are getting your urine protein in milligrams per millimole. Milligrams per millimole. If you want to convert it to our crazy American system, just multiply it by two. So, for example, if your urine protein is three milligrams per millimole, that would be the same as 30 milligrams a day. Under 30 milligrams of albumin a day is considered normal. 
if you got 30 to 300 milligrams of albumin in 24 hours in your urine, that's called mild uh, protein in the urine, and it's called microalbuminuria. There's all different kinds of names. So again, less than 30 milligrams per 24 hours, less than 3 milligrams per millimole is normal. If you go up to 30 uh, milligrams per millimole or 300 milligrams per day, that's when you've got significant protein in the urine. That's also called moderate to severe protein in the urine or macro, macro albuminuria, all different terms. So focus on the spot urine that your doctor should do or your dipstick, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And they're all measuring albumin. And the spot urine is measuring a sample of urine albumin and urine creatinine. And that's how they get an estimate. Your first voided urine, a good estimate of how much you're producing in 24 hours. Now, again, just to try to maybe get you more confused, but hopefully not. <clears throat> a lot of the world is using international units, which is per liter. In the United States, we measure things per deciliter, per DL. A deciliter is 100 cc's. A liter is 1,000 cc's. So don't get confused by the units. And again, if you are in milligrams per millimole, multiply it by 10 to get the roughly milligrams per day. And once you are over 300, you are at a significant risk of several things. And this is very important. Just like your EGFR, the lower your EGFR, the higher your risk of atherosclerotic blood vessel disease, hardening of the arteries, with the angina, the chest pain, the heart attacks, the heart to these events. And it may be even more important, it doesn't get enough attention. And especially for diabetics who already have a higher risk of hardening of grams per millimole, you got a significant risk of getting progressive kidney disease and, and take all of the risk factors that you can help yourself reduce your blood pressure under control, get your LDL under control, get your weight under control, exercise and try to decrease your stress in life is not useful. It's got to be repeated. And that's why to diagnose kidney disease, you got to have a repeated value that's the same or less after three months and get your trend over months and years. Same with urine protein. It can vary from day to day, month to month, week to week. But if you've got a pattern of 300 milligrams plus per day consistently, you're at a higher risk. And again, like we spoke about earlier, that's where you want to have a lower goal blood pressure and maybe consider low protein diets or very low protein if you're not diabetic. Now I have a question about the dipsticks. Is this something yeah. I could purchase and do here at home or my doctor writes a prescription and I pick them up and can do them at home? They're, they're, How do those work? Yeah, they're not for most people uh, with kidney disease that should be checked a couple of times a year. The dipsticks that measure albumin and they're getting more reliable. They're also measured colorometrically by a scanner that actually reads the color. Mm. So to get accurate dipstick readings, you need the lab to do that. And yeah. it's a good screen. And the reason why it's only a screen is the following. As you know, some days you produce a ton of urine because you drink a lot. Mm -hmm. Other days, for whatever reason, you get dehydrated and you produce very little urine. If you're in a situation where you're producing a lot of urine, you're drinking a lot, and then if you have a day where you're very concentrated because you're not drinking a lot, you may have a higher value on your dipstick because everything gets concentrated. So by your clinician, by the laboratory, uh, and it's more accurate if it's measured by the lab, it's still a good indicator. But 
Anyone with kidney disease should get a spot urine protein repeat for, or even maybe 3B, which we'll get to in a minute, which is uh, CKD3B would be uh, uh, 30 to 45. We'll get to that. In a yeah, minute. for me, whenever I do get labs, there's always the pee in the cup. And they, yeah. they run all the tests, which right. is great because then changes I may need to make. Exactly. Exactly, James. And again, there's strong evidence that that urine protein, the urine albumin, very high relationship between cardiovascular mortality and between rate of loss of kidney function. And what it reflects, the albumin in the urine, reflects something called glomerular disease or glomerulonephritis. The glomerular diseases are a whole bunch of them. There's IgA, there's membranous, there's diabetic. These are all generally called glomerular diseases, and they produce the increased albumin in the urine. Now, and there's been studies in Asia and Japan and Taiwan where they showed a very strong relationship between even consistently having one plus or more protein to a higher mortality. So if you've got kidney disease, proteinuria, please take seriously all the risk factors that can be modified that I talk about extents that moderate to severe protein in the urine or macroalbuminuria, you should be on an ACE. These are drugs that end in Pril, like Haptopril, or an ARB. These are drugs that end in TAN, like Losartan. These drugs for people with 300 or more milligrams per day or 30, milligram, 30 uh, um, milligrams per millimole or 300 milligrams per day, these drugs are crucial to slow the decline of your kidney function. And they may well reverse the high level of urine protein, which could be a good indicator of your loss of kidney function. And just like with your kidney measure, your GFR, you need to have repeated measures to get a reliable measure of how much protein you're putting out in the urine. And it's really interesting. You're looking at Australia, UK, um, uh, and uh, New Zealand. There's been a lot of debate about what's a normal total protein. I think it's not worth getting confused about it. Stick with the measure of urine albumin, and like I said, in the U.S., the dipstick 1 plus is like um, 100 milligrams per deciliter, which would be 1 gram per liter. That's a good bit of protein. Um, and, well, actually, uh, no, 1 plus, I'm not sure, maybe 10 I'm confusing myself. I think one plus maybe 10 milligrams per deciliter or 100 milligrams per liter. Two plus maybe. Uh, so um, one plus maybe significant. Two plus consistently you've got significant amount of proteinuria and you should be on an ACE or an ARB. Now we're going to spend a little bit of time moving to the big category that most of you <laughs> fall and I like the idea I'm getting it to like it more and more of dividing CKD3 into 3A and 3B mm -hmm. now why do I say I like it more well first of all the reason for creating these two different categories is the researchers are going to determine whether these categories have a different outcome when I talk about outcomes I'm not just talking about going on dialysis. I'm talking about rate of loss of kidney function or developing atherosclerotic complications or death. Uh, those are the outcomes, of course, of concern. But as we talked about before, your normal value, what you should have as an EGFR, will vary depending upon your age. And in general, if you're 5 or 70, Anything below 45, which is 3B, is probably considered abnormal. Now, what does it mean to be abnormal? All it means is that whether or not you got a higher risk of dying uh, compared to someone who does not have that same level of kidney function. 
It doesn't, of all the one, two, or three stage patients, I don't, may, let's just say stage one, two, and three A, your chances of going on dialysis may be one or two out of a thousand. So stage three A with or without some protein, and I'm going to wind up on dialysis. Very, very, very unlikely. Okay, something that you all need to take to heart. And the reason why I'm good with stage 3B is because if you're under 65, 75, then uh, EGFR of 60 or less, which is stage 3A, 45 to 60, that's kidney disease. So if you are under 65 and you've got an EGFR less than 60, you've got kidney disease. And actually, if you're under 45, your EGFR should be at least around 75. So as, as if you're a younger folk, um, an EGFR of uh, less than 75 may be of some concern. And James was asking me to talk about younger and older folks. I may do that in another conversation. Mm -hmm. And here's an example of where it makes a big difference. Because if you're younger, uh, you should have an EGFR over 75. And if, it's, and if it's 75 to 60 and you are, you know, under 45, you may have CKD. But again, not to worry a lot about it until you are one of those folks that also has a good bit of protein in the urine. And as we talked about, let's say you're 70 years old and you've got... Um, even an EGFR of 30 to 45, a lot of you may have that same level for 10 years or more. So it's not necessarily going to uh, decline. Um, and the main reason to know for anyone with CKD3 to know that you've got it is not to go on low protein diets, not to believe any of this woo woo about lowering creatinine, which is nonsense, because creatinine is just a marker of kidney function. It does not harm you. Creatinine mm -hmm. is not a harmful substance. It is a marker of kidney function. And that gets me to a question that I was asked last time. And we're going to get to some of your questions in a few minutes. So someone said they went on a plant-based diet and their kidney function changed. And I was a little bit too dismissive of it. And let me tell you why you could have a change in your EGFR by going on a vegan or a plant-based diet. That is possible because the amount of creatinine you produce, not your kidney function, but the amount of creatinine you're producing may change if you go on a plant-based diet. Mm. Or your level of creatinine may change if you way overhydrate yourself, you're not doing yourself a favor. It's not doing anything regarding your actual kidney function. The plant-based diet is great, and I'm all for it to help you live longer and decrease the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the, all the problems of hardening of the arteries. But when you go on a plant-based diet, you can get a short-term drop in your serum creatinine, and creatinine clearance is inversely proportional to your serum creatinine, or EGFR is inversely proportional to your serum creatinine. So if your creatinine goes down because you're on a plant-based diet or a vegan diet, you're taking very little protein in, you could get a drop in your serum creatinine, but that doesn't mean your kidney function got better. It's just when you drop, the, when the creatinine drops, you're going to have a reading of EGFR that may be higher. But, but if you are now on a stable diet, again, looking at kidney function, you need to be on a stable situation. You need to not have lost a lot of muscle. You need to not have changed your diet. When you're on a stable diet, stable weight, stable fluid intake, then the values of your kidney function over time mean something. That's the way you can trace if your kidney function over months and years is actually 
improving or getting worse. Yeah, and that's a really, really good point. I see in a lot of the message boards where people kind of encourage each other on how to game the system, like really, really overhydrate, which are then diluting it, your, your, your urine, and you're not helping yourself. Yeah, maybe your labs looked a little better, but they're wrong. And we need accurate labs to help us and to, to guide us to know, is this working or not? Um, so yeah, that, that, that's a really good point there. And, and don't try to look at one value. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen people say, oh, I went from 50 to 40, and that's because I went on an extremely low protein diet. Your kidney function may not have changed, as I just said. <laughs> It may just be a reflection of the amount of creatinine you're producing. So get into a stable state on a stable diet and watch your kidney function from there. And then you can tell what's really going on. And don't believe in any of these. I've got the magic bullet for your, you know, for your creatinine or, you know, take these magnets and use it for your creatinine or take this other woo woo you know, supplement or some other thing. It's nonsense. Right, right, you don't. Right now it's celery. That's the big thing for about the last three weeks is somehow celery and blueberries, but mainly celery is the magic cure. <laughs> you get it straight. Tell your friends, tell anyone else with kidney disease to not fool yourselves. Creatinine is a marker. It is a marker that we use to determine your GFR. There's another marker that we use to determine it called cystatin A. A lot of you never heard of it. You're not trying to get your cystatin A varied. <laughs> These are just markers of GFR. And creatinine itself is the marker of GFR. So that's all the creatinine is. And don't tr believe in any of these things about, you know, magically getting your creatinine to improve because it won't do anything for you. It, this is a long-term project, and the long-term project is to control the variables that we know affect loss of kidney function, which is blood pressure, which could be your LDL, which could be the medications that you're taking, especially ACEs and ARBs. And uh, as we talked about last a couple times ago, and I will, and I will get back to it, Diabetics now have what I call miracle drugs, mm -hmm. the SGLT2 drugs that have shown benefit for slowing kidney decline and living longer, less death from heart failure and heart disease. But that deserves a whole show. So we got some time for questions, James. Hey, we got quite a few questions here tonight. Let's see, hold on, I marked a bunch of them as they were going by. Let me go back here. All right, Cheryl asks, can you have low blood pressure and still have kidney failure? Yes, and in fact, if you are treated for high blood pressure and your blood pressure goes too low, and I consider too low sometimes below 110, sometimes below 100, if your blood pressure goes too low, that could make your kidneys unhappy. That could get your GFR to go down. And it is true that the vast majority of people who have CKD will have high blood pressure. But there can be people with CKD and low blood pressure. The commonest situation is people with a weak heart. If you have a weak heart, then you may have low blood pressure and the weak heart may contribute to your kidneys not working so well. And so that could give you an abnormal GFR on the basis of poor cardiac output, a weak heart. All right, our next question is from Kimberly. She says, and this is a great one because I just got back uh, three hours ago from getting my second COVID shot. She asked, will the COVID vaccine affect our kidneys? COVID vaccine does not affect the kidneys, but I will tell you this, especially if you are CKD4 or 5, and even CKD3A and B, 
you are at a higher risk of dying from COVID. A large, over a million patients, a UK study, showed that CKD patients, just like obese patients, just like people with diabetes, are at higher risk of dying from COVID. Please take the vaccine. Very good. All right. Well, we've got a lot of questions here. Um, Ray over in the UK asked, are the blood readings accurate when you're on dialysis? Okay. So this brings up an important point. And a lot of people start dialysis way too early and they realize the honeymoon is over. They may think for the first couple of weeks or months that they're feeling better and they may feel better, but then they say, I want out. I want out of here. This is too much. I can't stand being on a machine. So one of the problems is how do we determine how much kidney function you've got left? And the answer is the answer to your question. Dialysis is going to artificially lower various substances in your blood, including creatinine. And so you can't get an accurate measure of kidney function when you're on dialysis. There is a way to do it, which is to take your value of your, of your creatinine when you finish dialysis and then collect your urine for the two days in between dialysis and get the creatinine value before your next treatment. And you can average the urine amount of creatinine. Your doctor could figure out how to do it. One other way to do it is if you stop dialysis, and I'm not telling you to stop dialysis, but if you stop dialysis, then you can measure how much urine you're, you're putting out. And, and once your creatinine stabilizes, it could take a couple of days to a week, that creatinine could be used to determine what your actual kidney function is. So but yes, you need dialysis, to be creating urine. Right. If you're not making any urine or you make very little urine, you cannot get off dialysis. The only folks that may have a possibility of getting off dialysis is folks that are making a liter or two of urine, which there are lots of people early on dialysis that got put on too early are still making a good bit of urine. Very good. Now, Nancy and a few others have some questions about creatinine and exercise. Does intense workouts and lifting very heavy weights increase your creatinine numbers? It can. Again, another artificial way to alter your EGFR. Because if you get muscle breakdown, you could get more creatinine produced. So if you get an extreme uh, exercise, marathon, triathlon, extreme weightlifting, and you do get some muscle tissue breaking down, you will get, and, and creat creatinine is a byproduct of creatine from muscle. Creatine becomes creatine phosphokinase. It's an energy product that helps your muscles contract. So yes, you can get an artificially high creatinine, which will make your GFR look lower. Because again, creatinine is in the denominator. The higher the denominator, the lower the number. Your kidney function is inversely proportional to your creatinine. All right, very good. All right, someone asked, what is secondary FSGS? FSGS is also called focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. It is one of the glomerular diseases. It is one of the diseases that will increase the protein, the albumin in your urine. It will increase the proteinuria. Secondary, I'm not sure what they're referring to, but you can get this FSGS in, on, in many situations. It's actually been seen with COVID. It's been seen with intravenous drug abuse. Um, it's been seen with some of the genetic kidney disease in African Americans. So it's just basically something that the pathologist will look at the kidney and see certain changes on it to call it that FSGS. And there's a lot of different kidney uh, pictures. And as a matter of fact, there's a large project that has just started in the last few years 
where they're trying to get volunteers to get kidney biopsies so we can get the natural history of these various types of kidney disease like FSGS, like IgA nephropathy, like Mermidus GN, and a whole bunch of others. Cool. Now, Linda and a few others asked, does the colon colonoscopy prep hurt your kidneys? No, no, not at all. Um, the only situation is some of the preps may have a lot of phosphorus, and you have to look into that. If you are end stage, that could be a problem, but I've had so many of my patients on dialysis get colonoscopy, and really not a problem. The only theoretical problem is if you have advanced CKD and, and if there's a lot of phosphorus. Uh, the volume load, if you're um, you know, not making urine and you're not getting dialyzed, could be a problem. It's a rare problem, though. Most people, no problem to get colonoscopy. Great. <laughs> not that I ever won another one. I had one. That was one more than I needed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I didn't know that the cameras don't work going in. They only work coming out. <laughs> so they got to go all the way in. <laughs> yeah. Well, hope, hopefully you are under conscious sedation. You don't want to get one of those done if you're not under conscious sedation, James. So That's I had brutal. I had a light sedate. I was light sedative. I was completely awake laying in the fetal position and this is a funny story and then we'll get back to questions the girl assisting the doctor was someone i had just met the weekend before at club dance and that i was wow. hitting on <laughs> oh wow sounds like fun we never talked ever again after that never talk again yeah 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 okay i got you <laughs> all right here's a great one from cheryl is protein in the urine related to weight gain? There is uh, an, an, an obesity-related GN, and there is some data that obese folks, especially morbid obesity, may have higher urine protein. That's the only thing that I've heard of, but not a direct relationship. Great. And here's one. I know you'll love this question. It's about the vaccine. Desi asked, should I get vaccinated for COVID if my immune system has been suppressed? It looks like it's with the medication. She's 20, stage four, IgA, nephro, nef, blah, 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 blah. You know what I want to say. <laughs> Nephropathy. IgA, nephro yeah. yeah. Well, okay. This is a very complicated question. I don't, I don't have an easy answer. Um, so the people that are immune suppressed to transplant patients, patients that are on you know, cyclophosphamide or other immune suppressants, I think it's worth getting the vaccine. The problem is that you're going to have to be monitored to see what your antibodies uh, are, are, are being produced, how much of the IgG or IgM uh, COVID antibodies are being produced. It is recommended, but it's possible that you may not get quite the same reaction and, and immunity as somebody who's not immunosuppressed. Something you need to discuss with your uh, clinician, for sure. But it's, it's, I, think, I think it's worth getting it because you certainly are at a high risk of dying from COVID. Very good. Neela is in South Africa and she asked, how can she get your book? Well, I think James has a link. Um, I'll bring it right up here on the screen. This is to Amazon. Go.dadvicetv.com slash book will take you right to Amazon. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and certainly uh, it, you can look for it in bookstores and so forth. But the easiest way is to go uh, either get that link or put that title of my book, Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease, uh, on your Amazon search, and it should come right up. Yeah. And if you have a local bookstore... It's great to give them a call, give them some business. It's you know nice to support those mom and pops. You know Amazon is always a great source to go to. Uh, they're not hurting for sales, and the, the the small mom and pops I love seeing them still exist because I can take my kids there and they have a great time looking the book. So I encourage people to support them. Let Let me look at this question. Brian has a question about diet. 
the stage phi with high protein. Now I assume that's high protein in the urine and the need to gain weight. One of the things that all of you should know, especially those of you who are falling for this extremely low protein diet with keto acid supplements, which again, I do not recommend if you're diabetic. I do not recommend if you're above stage four. If you're stage four with a good bit of protein, maybe. But what happens as you get progressive kidney disease is malnutrition is a big problem. So unless you've got a good reason to be on a low protein diet, I do not encourage you to be on a low protein diet. And the need to gain weight is pretty common for people with kidney disease because nutritional parameters, all the usual things that the, the dietitians measure get worse with progressive kidney disease. And unfortunately, you know, one of the big issues about starting dialysis early was that, oh, it's going to help nutrition. The research shows no. Dialysis actually makes this nutritional problem with progressive kidney disease worse. So I encourage people to eat well and eat, you know, reasonable amounts of protein. And if you're at stage five, I would basically eat what you want as long as you're not having high potassium problems and try not to. I mean, I would try to eat a uh, plant-based diet and try not to have processed foods, a lot of the frozen foods, which could be high in phosphorus, which could also be a problem for some stage five people. Yeah, and a lot of them are these artificial chemical versions of phosphorus, which our body absorbs at a much higher rate than natural phosphorus. Um, so we are about out of time, Doc. Is there any last question you see that you well, like to answer? Let me just deal with cysts. I mean, a couple of questions on cysts. Cysts are very common. Mm -hmm. uh, all of us will have some cysts in our kidneys as we get older, not to worry. Polycystic kidney disease is a disease where you will have massive kidneys with numerous cysts and massive numbers of cysts. So that's not going to be the problem for most people. Proteinuria doesn't give you kidney stones. You could tell if your kidneys are damaged from stones by getting what they call an ultrasound. It'll tell you if one of your uh, kidneys is blocked uh, by a kidney stone. Um, I think that... Uh, uh, is plant inferior to meat? No. Uh, um, the frologist has said too much protein can increase toxins. No. There's too much protein does not give you toxins. I don't know who told you that. That's nonsense. Meat-based proteins are not as healthy for you. You're much better off with plant-based proteins regarding atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, and the things we've talked about over and over again. No, there's no toxins in, in protein. Very good. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up because we are now at the very top of the hour. We got a lot of questions in tonight, which is great. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Rowe, for being here again. Always great having you here. And if you guys would like to learn more from Dr. Rowe, you can check out his book, Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease. Let me bring up the link to it right there on the screen. If you go to go.dadvicetv.com slash book, that'll take you directly to his book on Amazon. If you got a local bookstore that you love to shop at, give them a call, give them a visit, and ask them if they can order you a copy of Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease by Dr. Rosansky. It's a book, if you guys don't have it, you're going to love it. It puts a lot of fears to rest. It talks about how important looking at things like protein that we talked about tonight is and it really is just it's easy to understand and a very calming book when you get kidney disease i wish doctors all gave this out to new patients instead of sending them to the internet and all the message boards where there's all sorts of um what do we call it? woo woo <laughs> yeah. of woo woo and scary stuff out yeah. there and i have seen unbelievable things that are being spread across the internet that are nowhere near true yeah. all right everybody thank you so much for being here tonight i'll be back tomorrow night with jen hernandez we are going to talk about five benefits <coughs> of a plant-based diet for people with kidney disease all right everybody thanks for joining us and i'll see you in the next video bye